In high school, we played a game. Many years later, we got back together to play one more. Little did we know, this time, the game was real. Join me, Aram Vartian, on Start Playing Games for a brand new type of fantasy role-playing. In Die RPG, you play a group of real-world, deeply flawed adults who are transported into a fantasy realm via a predatory, sinister role-playing game. The game transforms your characters into paragons and rewards them with strange and frightening powers. In Die RPG, you are confronted with your truest desires and deepest fears. And only you can decide when the game is over. Check out all of my available Start Playing Games campaigns at aram.gay. My name is Aram, and my pronouns are he, him. I am the writer and producer of the actual play Dungeons & Dragons podcast, God's Fall. My name is Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill Kill Every Every Monster. Monster. This week on Kill Every Monster, we are featuring the Goblin. The Monster Manual describes goblins as small, black-hearted, selfish humanoids that lair in caves, abandoned mines, despoiled dungeons, and other dismal settings. Individually weak, goblins gather in large, sometimes overwhelming, numbers. That's foreshadowing. They crave power and regularly abuse whatever authority they obtain. On this episode, we are joined by writer and game master Michael Loving, who is also known as Captain Mel, and whose pronouns are he, him. Michael Loving is a professional voice actor, game master, writer, and editor for tabletop RPGs. He is a regular cast member on the D&D actual play podcast, The League of Ultimate Questing, and an irregular guest on God's Fall when Aram bothers to make time for his friends. You can find him on Twitter at OG underscore Captain underscore Mel. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hello. I'm guessing I say hi at this point. Yes, now you can yes, talk. Yes, that's typically how that goes. <laughs> it's good to be here, Aram. Thank you for actually showing up to this recording. I managed to stay awake for once. <laughs> so, Michael, what is a goblin to you? Goblins are my favorite D&D monster to run. I run them a little bit off standard for the description that Dylan read. For me, goblins are... They're more like gremlins from the movie Gremlins, where they're incredibly chaotic, almost entirely thoughtless, not in like a dumb way, but in a in like a childlike, I have no concept of the consequences of my actions sort of way. And so goblins will just do anything with no regard for personal danger or the eventual consequences on the environment or the people around them. Mischievous or sometimes malicious glee in just causing a little bit of discord. There always seems to to be a prankster element to goblins, and there's just a different level of lethality attached to that. In my games, goblins breed like rabbits. So at any point, like a horde of goblins can just show up and... As a result, they have no sense of self-preservation, either individually or as a culture. Like, it's entirely reasonable for one goblin to just sacrifice another one to do something dumb, like make an alarm by tying a goblin to a door, and his job is to scream when the door gets opened. It's the thing that I think Pathfinder really sort of codified for goblins. I have steadfastly refused in both 4th and 5th edition to describe my goblins as looking anything other than my beautiful basketball-headed, ear-to-ear mouth goblins from Pathfinder. They're my very, very favorite. When you have a creature that's as long-lived, like, mythologically as a goblin, and you manage to define them for a group of people who are tremendous fantasy nerds, you did a good job, man. I gotta give them that. The last paragraph of the goblin description in 
the Pathfinder Bestiary, the, the original Pathfinder Bestiary, I haven't played second edition Pathfinder, says goblins are voracious and can eat their body weight in food daily without getting fat. And there's a couple other sentences, but that's like the important thing. So this is the other thing for me is goblins are like pranksters who are always looking for food. That part also ties into some of the uh, original uh, stories of them because the there are there's this idea that they're house goblins, right? And they live within your home. They come out at night, do certain chores, and then in exchange for doing those chores, they just take whatever food they want and then disappear back into the walls. Harry Potter, such an honor it is. Who are you, Dobby, sir? Dobby the house elf. There's been a ton of representation of goblins and goblin-like creatures in film. Uh, I think there's actually a movie series called Goblins. There's also, of course, Gremlins. You're thinking of Gremlins. No, 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 no. There's a whole so like no. There's a whole like subset of horror. There's like a Hobgoblin series and a Goblin series. There's a bunch of very bad movies out there. I think I think Troll Two is actually about goblins too. It's called Troll, but it's all about goblins. But it's actually about goblins. Why go for clarity? Also not a good movie, <laughs> for the record. It's terrible, but it does have the kind of goblins you're talking about, where they're just insanely chaotic and mischievous. Yeah. And deadly, a little bit. But more by accident. Like, they don't mean right. to kill someone, but they will. Right. Yeah, that's that's definitely how I play goblins, typically. There is a certain amount of cruelness to them, but it's it's mostly just accidental <laughs> they're accidentally evil as much as they are intentionally so there's a lot of times where in their lore D D tends to get like offensive or like they use stereotypes that really we as a culture should not be leaning on anymore all of those various fun options the goblins might be the monster i read that just reads as kind of lazy well, I mean, yes, but they the, there's this there's this whole thing about malicious ugly. So they're all they all enjoy being wicked. Which I mean, I think if you make that playful, like if they just enjoy making pranks, as opposed like if you soften that a bit, I think that works fine. That's all right. But there's also this part where where like they're all kind of doomed to like they don't have a choice in gods. They're like forced absolutely into one single god worship and when they die their souls go there by default whether or not they believe in them or not that's that doesn't feel great maglubiate is that how you say that maglubiate that's how i say it i don't think anyone knows it's a DD word we can make it up if you decide that the g in null is a hard g like what like gnoll no one can tell you you're wrong gnoll like gnoll no you can't I could decide it's pronounced Gnoll. And no, you can't. No. I did. No, I reject that. <laughs> Leave this in the episode. <laughs> Our listeners will learn that they are we're wrong. We're going to have a poll, and we're going to see how many of you think Dylan is wrong. Goblins in 5th edition are generally kind of written to be murdered, and not even in a way that's like particularly motivated, right? Like the hag, which we'll talk about later, plays off of a lot of really unfortunate anti-Semitic and misogynist tropes. And there's the vampire that has a whole bunch of like horror baked into it to make you want to fight these things. Goblins are just built to be worthless little shits, but they're my worthless little shits. And that's why I love them. <laughs> something to slaughter your way through. Would that be it? Like you would just invade their lair and murder all of them and take the meager possessions that they have? Is that why you would use goblins? One of the things I think is is kind of interesting about goblins is if the DM plays them really smart, they can be absolutely lethal, especially to low-level characters because of their nimble escape ability and they can hide as a bonus action on their turn. There's not much reason for a goblin to ever actually engage, kind of like a rogue, in direct melee combat versus just staying at range, shooting with a short bow, moving and hiding so that you can't fight back, and then attacking with advantage again on their next turn. And then you've got 14 goblins that are all, well, probably not 14 at level one. You've got four goblins who are all attacking with advantage every turn, 
can't be counterattacked because you don't know where the fuck they are, and each of them has twice the likelihood of rolling a crit because they're attacking with advantage. So they're almost never going to miss. And if they crit, they're dealing 2d6 plus 2 damage to a first level character, which will kill just about any of them. It's kind of funny that they're like, oh, goblins are first level enemies, because unless you play them totally reckless and dumb, you could play them as being just devastating guerrilla commandos. If they're well trained, they're unstoppable. If they're the goblins you're talking about, then they're kids, so they're not trained. They don't have any tactics. They're just random and chaotic. Right. They don't really take advantage of that ability to its maximum capacity for me, especially against a first level party, because my God. It's legitimately presented almost as the neutral foe. Like they don't have a culture. They don't have a society. They have doing a murder, having some slaves being dead and not being happy about it. They, they actually like pointedly don't have a culture. Like the, the book, te- the book makes a point of being like, they're cruel and black hearted. They don't build anything. They just move into like abandoned structures and caves. They have no art. They have no anything like that. Specifically dehumanized little mischievous shits. That's one of the reasons that I play them the way that I do is to differentiate them from kobolds, which are your other sort of classic low level, you know, because otherwise you've just got two little small sized creatures that live in the caves and and fight people. So you have to do something to differentiate goblins and kobolds. I think my favorite sentence describing goblins full stop. There's just one line in the monster manual. Goblins are lazy and undisciplined, making them poor servants, laborers and guards. Everything about them is shit. There is no reason for them to exist in universe. They themselves don't seem to particularly want to exist in universe. The universe itself tells you also these guys suck. And not in a malicious bad way, just like they're kind of terrible. Goblins know they are a weak, unsophisticated race that can be easily dominated by bigger, smarter, more organized, more ferocious, and more magical creatures. And like, it would be be really great if they were like, you know, goblins are unfortunately the target of bigger creatures who can push them around. And because of that, they band together and look out for each other and protect each other. You know, why, it, it just, it, it doesn't make any sense that goblins would survive without doing that. With And the fact that they do have huge families would encourage you to say that they're tight knit, that they're, you know, that everyone is their cousin or their uncle or their aunt. And so the tribe would be incredibly familiar. Like that's to me what a goblin should be and how they would make sense in this world. If you at least gave them some form of ambition, like if you gave them that idea of like, we know we are the lowest of the low, we are the garbage, like, When an adventurer decides they're no longer a shit farmer and that they're going to go on an adventure, they come kill us. So if you had a goblin that, like, saw something that wasn't immediately going to kill it and their response was, oh, I could be like that guy. And suddenly you have, like, if the, the hobgoblins don't necessarily need to subjugate goblins, hobgoblins are, like, the big, better version of goblins, so all the goblins look at them aspirationally and are like, fuck, yeah, no, tell me what to do, sir. I would think that hobgoblins in general would be annoyed by goblins, but if they saw anyone picking on them, they would pick up a club and knock them the heck out. They're like your big brother. They don't necessarily want to hang out, but they will throw down for you if you're in trouble. So, Michael, do you think goblins are monsters? Honestly, I don't really. I I think of goblins as being more childlike than monstrous. In, in, a, in a way, while they do bad things, I don't think they necessarily do them on purpose. And I don't think that they're inherently evil the way that I do think of them as being kind of inherently chaotic. But I don't I don't think I don't think goblins are automatically evil and i don't think that they're automatically monstrous if you judged every child's behavior at adult expectations they'd all be evil little monsters but they're not they're just right they're just children right they're functioning like rats they want food 
They want the shiny thing. They they just want stuff. Why would they go up against the f- the guy throwing fire and the big scary axe? Like I just want. I I was gonna steal a cow because I've heard that you can make those into food. Now when we get the cow back to our lair, we're gonna have to figure out that middle process. Right. Somebody somebody's gonna just like try and take a bite out of it raw while it's still alive. That goblin immediately gets kicked in the head. That goblin is dead, and all of the other goblins are just like, you know what? I I really like this as an idea moving forward. If goblins are the world's science, but only through trial and error. Right. Like, there is... There is no hypothesis phase of testing. It's just slam forward, and eventually you will wind up with brilliant advances. They are going to go from cow to a perfectly done steak, right? But 12 of them are going to die. The the way I do goblin technology is they're, they're sort of natural-born tinkers, but all goblin technology essentially requires the expenditure of goblin lives to achieve and typically will only work the once. So they can, they can build anything, but it will fail spectacularly when it accomplishes whatever its task was, and at least one goblin will die in the process. And they all just kind of accept that as, as part of you know, <laughs> the, the system. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Those goblins make a lot of sense. They're, they are narratively far more focused. They're way more coherent to exist in a world. But they're probably less fun. No, they'd be a huge amount of fun because you could still play them as these mischievous fucking assholes and you could do a lot of things with them. And they could also be then this society that you could visit and learn from and make exchange with. Maybe they're just these repeating background characters. Not You don't have to fucking kill every... I know. Wait. Okay. No, I know. I, yeah, I know. You don't have to kill every monster. <laughs> but I'm just saying you don't always have to kill every monster. I do quite like the idea actually of like going and meeting with goblins to to exchange some sort of trade for their their technological knowledge. That's the first society to develop actual firearms, learned it all from goblins and paid them in socks. The goblins are ecstatic. 100%. If anyone invents guns in a fantasy world, it should be goblins. And a lot of them would have died getting there, but it absolutely should be goblins. Maybe a lot of people die building the farming machines, okay? And maybe a lot of people die building the tunnels to to plant all the mushrooms. Fine. I get that there's going to be sacrifice, but they do it. They're able to create these amazing things, these truly amazing things, because they stick together, they work for a common good, and they understand that if they don't look out for themselves, no one else will. That's the goblin I want to see. The only thing in Volos that I particularly liked that they brought up was the idea of a Nilbog. An evil prankster spirit will eventually possess a goblin that has been treated too badly, and that goblin will ruin your fucking day. I do like that a lot. So you have hobgoblins wandering around, occasionally being awful to their minions, but also occasionally just like holding back a little bit because they're like, uh, if I, is he going to get possessed by an evil ghost that hates me? Yeah, you don't want to nibble on him. Which has inspired the existence of goblin jesters throughout the goblinoid courts because you have to have one goblin that's just real happy to, I guess, bring up the average. I didn't quite yeah, follow that. It doesn't logic. quite explain how that works. <laughs> so you can just have one utter idiot who's allowed to do anything he wants. And as long as you don't F with him, it's kosher. But like one guy spits on him and slaps him and the deal's off. And then he's instantly that creature. Everything related to goblins works at roughly the same level of cognizance as goblins. So it's if this spirit exists, this Nilbog sort of floats through and it sees the jester. It's like, okay. And then just leaves. That's kind of how I read it, was that they have like a ceremonial Nilbog. This is the goblin jester. We don't need a real Nilbog. We have a pretend one now. <laughs> It's why the inventiveness, the impulsiveness all adds up really well. You want an entire culture and spirituality built around this idea that like, eh, don't think too hard. 
One of the things that, that I like that, that D&D sort of um, canonized as far as the goblins are just ridiculous is the uh, Tomb of Annihilation battle stack. The Batiri goblins can like jump on each other's shoulders and and become more effective fighting as, as a, a pile of goblins. What changes would you make to Dungeon and Dragons Goblin? You mean other than make them Pathfinder Goblins again, which they probably can't do for copyright reasons? I would probably get rid of Nimble Escape just because it's too, it's too commando-like. If they use it just to run away and hide and be cowardly, sure, but it also means they can be super effective. I would give them something more like a modified version of Pack Tactics, where if they're fighting together, they, they get better just by weight of numbers alone treat goblins like say minions in uh, edge of the empire if there are a bunch of them together they roll for their attack and then their damage is increased based on how many goblins are currently attacking but right. now they're currently one creature yeah it's a real simple mechanic and it ties in nicely to the idea that goblins have to work together in order to survive as a podcast network our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you but we also sell merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell and grow at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, so wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. With the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify has allowed us to share something tangible with the podcast community we've built here, selling our beanies, sweatshirts, and mugs to fans of our shows without taking up too much time from all the other work we do to bring you even more great content. And it's not just us. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify is also the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash R-E-A-L-M now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. So, Aram, after, uh, after a long life of adventuring, warring, I was a battle rager after a long life of warring. And I am in the Dwarven Union, and I am well set up in my retirement. After a long life of going off to war, fighting these battles, coming back home, you decided you need a little bit of peace and quiet. Enter Milberg. Milberg, so named because there are both a water mill and a windmill. They have not yet figured out how to make a third kind of mill, but they're working on it. The goblins could figure out how to make a third kind of mill. You found this little town. It's nice. It's peaceful. There's a little bit of traffic that comes through now and then just for trade. But really, it's only enough to sustain itself. And you did the thing you've been waiting to do for a while. You opened up your little brewery. Yes. Aram, tell me how life has gone since retirement. Fivig Face Stomper. Fuck off. Fivig Face Stomper was a battle rager. And battle ragers are both respected and feared amongst the dwarves. They basically put on a breastplate, a spiked armor, and hurl themselves into the middle of the fray, chopping and slashing, you know, blind rage until they've killed everything moving. Fivig in his retirement is looking to be calm. He has trouble being calm, but brewing beer, being in this small town, walks along the river, these things help calm him, especially his garlic beer. 
he has a fondness for garlic beer. He experimented with onion beer, but he really thinks he's got something special with this garlic beer. He, he's had some issues convincing the locals, but he himself is fully sold on the garlic beer. There is a festival every year right around the harvest. And like recently, uh, due to some droughts, it's been hard to get good ale out here. Just people are kind of keeping their resources to themselves. And at this point, the town has kind of defaulted to, we will try the garlic beer this year. Excellent. Oh, what an opportunity. I, he has put on his finest. He is, he, is, he is brushing his hair and doing his beard, making sure all the little rings are in his beard. He's, he's putting on his old military jacket that doesn't quite button in the front anymore. And his, his boots are nicely polished. And oh, he just takes a deep breath, and looks in the mirror, and is like, Fivig, you've got this. Aram, can you describe to me what a battle rager's a military coat looks like? Does it have, like, torn off sleeves? <laughs> right. So you think of, like, yeah, you know what? It's like an 80s leather jacket with torn off sleeves, and it's got the name of his unit spray painted on the back, and there's big, huge spikes along the shoulders, and then also along, they took the cuff of the jacket, ripped it off, and then formed a cuff on their wrist with it. There's, like, some old paintings of him with, like, a mohawk. He doesn't have the mohawk anymore, right? But he used to have a big, huge mohawk. Also spiked. It was absolutely Liberty Spikes. All of this man was Spikes. Everything was Spiked. There has been a bit of an issue lately where, like, a family of skunks seems to have gotten into town. And basically every dog has kind of been kept inside lately, which has meant that, like, things have gotten quiet for the first time in a while. And that means that, like, you can hear the people sort of celebrating, getting excited. Uh, they're going to do a big sort of ceremony. They're going to let you tap the first barrel and, like, pour the first sort of the first beer of the festival. Everyone still thinks the skunks are out. Like, no, 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 that's just the garlic beer. No, that's that's mine. I I did a great job with it. Yes, it's hearty. Trust me. As you make your way through town, we're going to go over to Mel. You know, and I say you uh, as a plural, the lot of you know that every year this town has a festival. And at this festival, they drink. It's hard for a group of goblins to buy booze, mostly because merchants assume that you're looting them, which you are. But you know that if you're careful about this, you can take the town's booze, and then you'll have booze. So I want you to walk me through the master plan. Okay. So, the plan has begun already with releasing the skunks in the ho- uh, near the homes of the people with dogs. That way, the dogs get put inside because dogs are very disagreeable to my plans. So now that we've got the dogs inside, does the town have any, like, guards? No, this is a little fucking nothing hamlet. They, they've they got what they need to get by, and that's about it. Really, the, the security is a soldier moved into town a while back, but he looks like an old son of a bitch. It's the only reason that they tolerate me. I was able to, like, frighten off someone at some point. I'm highly annoying. No one really likes my garlic beer idea. I make a lot of noise. It smells all the time. I'm rather pompous, but I will protect them if needed. Where, where's, the, where's the target? Where's the, where's the best alcohol the town has are they are they keeping it at the brewery is that where we're going you know that if you're just early enough you can get to the church before they take the beer out for the big kind of ceremonial start of the festival and if you can get it there then you can launch the entire town into chaos and all you've got to do is get away while everybody's trying to figure out well what is happening i like this plan okay 
if it's quiet when you steal the beer, then if someone notices you stealing the beer, they immediately know that you're stealing the beer. So that immediately throws everything right. Right, right, right. If they don't immediately clue into what's going on, that buys you time. Yes. You okay. Think. I would right. also think that Fivig is a bit nervous about today going, well, he's putting on a brave face, but he is very invested here and he wants everything to be perfect. And I do believe he would double check the beer. So while the rest of the town is probably setting up in the main area, he would wave and say and say hello and then go to the church t- to check on that beer. Michael, mm-hmm. you are in the church. How many how many are in your main uh larceny? So there's um the six sort of strongest goblins. Mostly the six strongest goblins. <laughs> A couple of them aren't that strong. Are here because uh, even you know dwarven quarter kegs of beer are are pretty heavy when you're a goblin that weighs fifty pounds soaking wet. So they need they need the stronger goblins to to move the kegs around, and and then we'll figure out later how we're gonna get these out of town. So there's six people here. So the six of you hear the door open. <laughs> Blood and spikes, spikes and blood. Step one is going to be to hide. Axes and stone. Immediately, the six goblins just scatter like cockroaches. Roll me, let's say, uh, a, a low, a medium, and a high stealth checks. Okay. Drop their heads until they break. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Okay, so <laughs> the goblins who are good at stealth get a 23 the goblins who are relatively average at stealth six and the goblins who have disadvantage because they're wearing uh armor that gives them disadvantage on stealth checks even though they're not that bad at stealth managed like a nine (laughs) because i rolled really bad uh fivig i want you to roll me or even just what's your passive perception walking into the fucking church my passive perception is 14. So you immediately see four goblins. Mel, where does he see these goblins? Fivig can see here in the darkness that an attempt has been made to hide. It hasn't gone super well. One goblin has jumped into an open barrel, but is slightly too tall for this barrel. And so their ears are like sticking up out the top. There's another one that looks like it has just climbed into a wood stove. Another one has attempted to duck behind a support pillar, not realizing that putting themselves between the pillar and the wall gives you a clear line of sight to them. The last one pulled a lid off of a barrel and jumped into it, not realizing that that barrel was full of holy water this church is dimly lit right now also human children indistinguishable from goblins and the human children in this village are particularly unruly just shitty kids he marches up to the one in the barrel and just reaches in and grabs an arm or a shoulder or whatever and yanks him out fivig pulls a goblin out Come here, you little. and as a battle rager you've probably fought quite a few goblins You have just enough time to register that the mouth is too big, the teeth are too pointy, the ears are too long, before a short sword materializes and gets stabbed at you. Oh, eat shit and die, dwarf! (laughs) Does an eight hit your armor class? Not even close. I have you by one wrist, holding you at arm's length, and you're just swiping and swiping, but you're like missing by a full four inches. Yeah, that short sword just goes just whizzing past you. Rum, you're you're currently holding a very angry goblin that is trying to stab you and it's going very poorly. What do you want to do? He has fought goblins clearly in the past and goblins wouldn't rank very high as a threat in his mind, at least not on, at least not individually, but he's experienced. So the first thing he's doing is looking for the rest of them while he just shoves this one's head into the barrel of water and just holds them under. 
Jesus Christ. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is, one, you're going to make your actual perception check. See if you notice the last two. 11 plus 4 is 15. You saw the three shapes. Now that you're actually looking, you can tell that, like, the other three shapes you saw were also not children. For now, you can make a uh, grapple check at advantage to drown a goblin, I guess. First roll is 20. 17 plus 3. My second roll is 18 plus... Um, no, I'm sorry, is 21. 18 plus 3. So 21. Okay, uh, Mike, you want to oppose that grapple? This is Rumble that he's got uh, grappled right now. Uh, Rumble is going to make an acrobatics test to try and uh, avoid being grappled. Oh, man, I'm rolling real bad. That's an 8 plus 6 for 14. You grab this thing, and it's almost that cartoonish, like you pull the arm down, and the goblin just goes up and flips and does the whole... Basically, you just drag the entire thing into the uh, barrel. There's the little bit of scrabbling, but you're just kind of holding it there and trying to get eyes on the rest of the goblins and make sure you know exactly where they are. But you're going to have to hold that goblin there for a... It's going to take a while for that to really take effect. Despite the fact that he's a battle rager, he needs to understand what he's facing before he really lets loose. So he's going to hold him there. It's more for intimidation as he calls out. I know you're here. I saw you. Come out now. I'll let you live. So, Mike, what I want from you is an insight check. Uh, from who? Actually, it doesn't matter. They all have the same wisdom score. I customized their stats. I don't think a single one of them got a wisdom bump. Uh, that is a nine. The two goblins that are still hidden, they do not recognize that they were not seen. The remaining five goblins in the room, what do they want to do as Rumble is held in this barrel? Our goal here is to steal some booze. Therefore, at this point, several kegs are just going to like sprout legs and start running out of the room at maximum goblin speed a whopping 30 feet. The second that Fivik saw that, he would immediately let go of Rumble and go to try to stop the barrels from leaving. Which means we're going into initiative. Aram, cut, cut around this, because this is going to be a couple of minutes. All right, let me give you mine. Mine is going to be... Oh my, well... I rolled a one. One plus one is two. This is true. Good math, Aram. First up in the initiative is many, many goblins. So, Michael, you want to run us through the people that Aram is aware of? Tied at 16, we have Rumble and Bumble. And at 12, there's Meatbag. And at seven, there's Bullrush. Rumble's the one who had his head in a barrel. Um, his personality is fighty, so he's going to come spluttering out of the barrel, <laughs> draw his second short sword, and he's going to attack. At disadvantage. At disadvantage. At disadvantage, yes. First attack. I rolled a 10 on both dice, so 14 to hit. My AC is 15. Uh, second attack with his bonus action is also at disadvantage. Uh, that's only a 10, so he misses both attacks. Bullrush and Meatbag both grab barrels and run. Bumble charges you because you were holding his brother in the uh, water. And he's going to attempt to shove you and knock you over. He's still wearing the wood stove, by the way. He's just running with it on him? His legs stick out the bottom and he's just running with a wood stove. Or in a wood stove. Here's how we're going to do this. He's trying to knock you down, Aram. So I'm going to give him advantage on this because of the added weight of the wood stove. But... If you beat his lower roll, so he's going to roll twice. If you beat the lower roll, he might knock you over, but he'll also fall over. Yeah, that'd be really bad. For him. I like that. Okay, excellent. Natural 20 plus five is 25. Yeah, I, I've got a 16. <laughs> the Fivik's just working, on in, just working on pure instinct. When something comes at him, he rolls out of the way. He takes the hit and rolls. 
It's going to take you a second to scramble back up to your feet, but you're sure that eventually you can probably figure it out or maybe get out of the wood stove or possibly be trapped here forever. It's going to definitely be one of those three things, though. It's probably about this time that Aram notices this wood stove is like older and like beat to hell and doesn't actually belong in this church. This is Bumble's armor that he built for himself. It's just a wood stove that he wears. The little the little plate on the front where you would like open it to put logs, that's like hanging up, like flapping open for his head to stick out of so he can see. Grumble is on. No, not Grumble. Fuck. What, who is in the goddamn stovepipe? Bumble. 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 There's Rumble, Grumble and Bumble. Bumble is on the ground. Two goblins have taken barrels and just made a break for it. Bumble is rolling on the floor. I believe there are two more goblins that get to act before Aram. Uh, there's one more goblin who gets to act before Aram, and then one goblin that Aram doesn't know about who will act after him. The goblin that is going before him is got a strength of eight. So I don't know if he can carry a keg on his own. Give me an <laughs> athletics check to carry a keg. He'll attempt to carry one. Uh, you know, that's a 13. Yeah, that seems fair enough. Dogbait manages to start dragging this keg out of here. He's wobbling back and forth. Dogbait's moving at half speed here with, with the keg that he's barely able to drag out. The other two are a bit stronger. They actually, like, moved. Fizzig, two uh, barrels of your uh, of your beer that have just stood up and run away. There's another one that a goblin is trying to lug out, but the goblin is roughly the size of the barrel, and he's having a lot of trouble. There is a wood stove on the the floor the one wet goblin exists still presumably i am dressed as i would as a soldier which means i would be carrying the things i would as a soldier two of those things are my axe and what looks like a flask what looks like a water a skin he reaches for the axe but pauses and a little smile curls up on his a face and then he reaches for his decanter of endless water and he uncorks it and he sends a geyser at the goblins running with the barrels. Okay, I'm willing to say that you can probably catch uh, at least two of them. How does the decanter of endless water work for this? produces 30 gallons of water that gushes forth in a geyser 30 feet long and one foot wide. As a bonus action while holding the decanter, you can aim the geyser at a creature you can see within 30 feet of you. The target must succeed at a DC 13 strength saving throw or take one die for bludgeoning damage and fall prone. Two of the goblins are moving relatively at speed. One of them is stumbling along. Who are you targeting? I'm gonna target who's ever closest to the exit. Uh, that would probably be Bull Rush. Bullrush is faster than Meatbag. Well, Bullrush is stronger than Meatbag, so Bullrush is probably uh, moving a little quicker. Okay. So, Bullrush needs to make a strength save. Strength save. Natural 20 for a total of 22. Jesus. Wow. Okay. The equivalent of being hit by a fireman's hose, and they're still going. That's fine, because you hit him in the back, and he just stumbles further out the door. Everything is fine. I believe Grumble is the last goblin remaining. Unless, uh, Aram, you've got a bonus action or something. Uh, that was my bonus action to aim it. It was my action to uncork it, my bonus action to aim it. I think Grumble's going to help Bumble stand up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Grumble, Rumble, and Bumble are brothers if you haven't put that together yet. Yeah, I like them. It's a shame I have to kill them. Another goblin comes running out of the shadows. You did not know that there was an excess goblin. What? It tries to help the wood stove to its feet. That's nice. To kill is it my turn yet? No. <laughs> no. This is now it's now it's all of their turns again, around. Bullrush is the first to enter the light of day as he's sprinting past this dwarf, and then he's blasted from behind with water. And he probably does that little cartoonish like rolls over the barrel but keeps a hold of it and just hits his stride again on the other side. Uh, and it is a mess of goblins' turns. He gets knocked down, right? But the barrel lands in in like a river of water, and then he just rides it right out the door. Yeah, that was actually that was actually what I was picturing happening too. 
is the geyser like instant or does it does it go for a while the geyser stops at the start of my turn so it would continue uh until my action meatbag is going to attempt to do the same thing then he's just gonna like throw his barrel into the stream son of a bitch and then actually meatbag's gonna run back and grab another barrel and throw that in the stream too he's just gonna use your geyser of water to to, to fling barrels out of this room <laughs> And the barrel passes its strength save. So the barrel isn't immediately like blasted against a wall and shattered. It <laughs> does just like proceed through this geyser and everything is more or less fine. And one of the goblins, Rom, runs straight past you again, back into the church towards I'm gonna say the remaining barrel. We're gonna we're gonna have four barrels in play. Wait, if they run past me, is it an attack of opportunity? Do you have a weapon out? I'm gonna punch it. I was going to say, can he make an unarmed strike? Yeah, I'd be happy to make an unarmed strike. I'd be very happy to kick this goblin. Yes, 100%. For one plus your strength modifier damage? Yes, exactly. So for four damage, if I hit, I will punch this. I will, I will, I'm firing the stream of water and I will kick this little bastard as it runs past me. That is going to be 18 plus five is 23 for four points of damage. Uh, Yeah, Meatbag takes four points of damage. <laughs> Was he able to, after being punched, to grab the barrel and throw it out the room still? So I'm going to say you got the first barrel thrown, and then you can run back to get the other barrel. Okay. So all basically right, you it. have all all barrels are currently in transit. Okay, Meatbag, Meatbag's just grabbed the fourth barrel because he his first one went out, Bullrush Road one out, and Dogbait is um, also uh, headed that direction. I managed to take your legs out, but it just propelled you forward and you landed on a barrel, rolled with it and are already running. Like every action I take, even when I'm successful, just seems to help you. Rumble's gonna fight you because Rumble is fighty. <laughs> That's Rumble's personality is fighty. I like Rumble. Don't knock my brother over, you jerk. That's not gonna hit you with his main attack, second attack. Nope. <laughs> Rumble needs new dice. Rumble is very fighty, but Rumble is not a good fighty. Not very effective, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was a 13 and then a 7. Those are going to miss. Yeah, both of those will miss. So that's Rumble. Bumble is going to run and help Dogbait with his... Actually, Bumble's just going to pick up the barrel that Dogbait is carrying with Dogbait still hanging off of it and just run out the door. Do we have any other... Sorry, I keep losing track of goblins. There, there are already too many. Do we have anyone else acting at the moment? Dogbait hasn't acted yet, but Dogbait is just going to kind of go along with Bumble. You have the first goblins who see the light of day and this town, this small, kind of little dreary town that has just been living a relatively peaceful life, aside from a constant reek of fermenting garlic, is confronted with a storm of goblins and a geyser of water and a series of barrels, some of which have legs, one of which has legs and also a second goblin attached to it, sprinting out into the town square in the middle of a festival. <laughs> and just an obscene amount of dwarven cursing. Words that they do not understand, but they know not to enjoy. <laughs> Everyone in town is probably keenly aware of who's responsible for this. And then just the just this erupting roar from Fivig as he finally just loses it. Fivig, it is your turn. What had been a rather lighthearted sort of romp ends. If this was a movie, there would definitely be a music shift. There'd be a darkness and a shadow that falls across Fivik's face as he lets this decanter that's, you know, hung over his body by a leather a strap just fall to his side as the water peers out. And he reaches back and he pulls out this axe, this heavy, two-handed dwarven axe covered in ruins and stained with the blood of many, many enemies. Who is the nearest goblin? Rumble, the one that's been fighting you this whole time. He would turn, like he's been ignoring Rumble the whole time. Rumble's just been missing. He's really not been paying him attention, but his eye just turns to him and he swings. As, as this happens, Rumble like looks at you, pull this axe out. Where the shit was he keeping that informal clause? 
So 17 plus six is 23. 23 hits. I think that hits a goblin. Yeah. And I roll 11 plus four is 15 points of damage. Ron, uh, how do you obliterate this goblin? Yeah, that uh, rumble rumble is very good, very dead. Just takes the head off. It's just clean. He he is not showy. He's efficient. He simply decapitates that goblin. Is there another goblin nearby, like within five feet? Is there another goblin next to me? Meatbag might be. Meatbag was the one that rolled back in, that ran back in and got uh, kicked in the in the stomach, and is now carrying a barrel. Let's say that he, he ran through, he grabbed the, the barrel, and he's basically gotten back more or less to Fizvig. One clean motion. It's surprisingly fast for this old man dwarf. He just comes just at neck level, takes the first goblin's head clean off, takes this fighting goblin's head clean off, carries through, and catches the other goblin in the side as they're running with the barrels. Okay, give me the roll for that. 16 plus 6 is 22. That's going to that's gonna hit me back, too. 12 plus 4 points of damage for 16 points of damage as I simply eviscerate him. Poor me back. No, that is through the goblin and into the wall of the barrel. Just this explosion of garlic ale everywhere. I just get soaked in it. Once again, even when I'm successful, they still get the upper hand somehow. What's really sad is if poor Meatbag hadn't taken that attack of opportunity, he'd have survived that. But <laughs> is one of the gob is the goblin that goes after Rom still alive? Yes, it's still alive and it's still in the basement. Let's grumble, but not for long because <laughs> it's gonna run. Fair. It's it's brother and Meatbag just got just got uh, gibleted down here. So Grumble is gonna take off. Is this the full like bonus action disengage? I was going to say, if he's close enough to uh, Fivig that he needs to disengage in order to move past him, definitely. Otherwise, he's just he's just going to run. After seeing that turn of events, this heist has just gotten too real. And he gets out into the uh, into kind of the main thoroughfare. You can see people are panicking. There are the uh, barrels still kind of trying to make their way down the street. And then you come running out. Do you say anything or announce anything to the other goblins? Or yeah, Grumble will. Uh... He got me back, and and Grumble boss, they're both dead. We better get moving. He's pretty dangerous. Say lovey, let's go. I always told Grumble he was gonna get hurt if he kept fighting like that. It wasn't gonna work very well. You gotta pick your battles, Grumble. As I always said, always said it. Yep, always said it. This is like a conversation taking place at like just jogging goblin speed. Well, I think the goblins are kind of congregating in the, in the square. They're all like regrouping now that they're out of the church. And this is a, this is a non militant town. Like these are farmers. They don't even have stat blocks. So this is a group of people who have just heard tell of goblin raids and are terrified. So you are actually getting a weird wide berth where you're just standing in the center of town with a bunch of barrels going like, oh, this didn't work out as well as it could have. Where the hell is Snails? Elsewhere in town, uh, Snails and Panic uh, have stolen a, a horse cart, a horse pull, a horse drawn cart. Panic is nervously like running around in the back of the cart looking for threats while Snails is just kind of casually coaxing the donkey that's pulling it at, like, barely a trot. Like, Snails is not in a hurry to get anywhere, and Panic is freaked out. So it'll probably be another round, at least, before Snails actually gets here. Cut back to Town Center, and they're just waiting on the card, huh? They're not thinking they're going to be able to outrun very many people carrying these barrels, so they're trying to... They're trying to get out with the cart, and the cart isn't here like it was supposed to be, because they put Snails in charge of being their getaway driver. Aram, on your turn, you look outside and see the festival. What was supposed to be sort of your crowning moment where the town like had your garlic beer, recognized your brilliance, everyone enjoyed it, it's going to be a great party. Everything is in shambles. Things have been knocked over, you know, little stalls have been abandoned, people are running in just random directions, and there are currently four goblins standing there, leaning up against three uh, 
three barrels, just kind of looking around like they're waiting for something. What do you do? Yell, just... And they just come barreling out of the church, axe over my head, glisten with blood, eyes wild. I am God now. I am in full warrior mode, and I am sprinting towards those goblins to sink my axe in one of them. Lucky for me, dwarves only have a 25-foot movement speed. I don't get extra movement when I rage. That is a bummer. I really should get more movement when I rage. They do, but I don't think they have it by level four. Yeah, it's the fifth level thing, which you stole from me. Yep. <laughs> but I do have this bonus action. I mean, I mean, we could say you've got some spikes and you could just come flying tackle spike attack somebody. If I was a Marine in full dress blues and actually pulled that dress saber and then stabbed someone with it, that's the equivalent of what I'm doing right now. I rolled to hit a 13 plus five is 18. Yeah, so you go and basically just bodily throw yourself and all of your spikes into a horde of goblins. Three plus three is six points of damage as he just literally tackles the first goblin he can reach. Plus two, because I'm raging, so make that eight points of damage. That was Grumble. Grumble was the last one out the door, so Grumble's probably the one that takes this attack. Grumble's alive, but he's hurt pretty bad. Grumble kind of takes this hit. You come flying out of the church. You throw yourself against this goblin and just slam him back into the barrel. As you kind of pull away, expecting just to find paste, he just barely manages to kind of pull himself back up to his feet. I believe it's actually Grumble's turn now. We're kind of stuck here until the uh, until the cart gets here. Grumble is going to take his Warhammer and take a swing at you. 13. <laughs> 13 is not going to hit. Man. No one's landed a blow on me yet. Not a single blow. It's coming, Aram. Don't you worry. So we're back up to the top. At initiative count 20, I take a lair action. Uh oh. Not really. I just I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tap. Yeah, he's uh, oh. one of one of my expendable <laughs> goblin a bad minions. DM. Of course you don't take a lair action. You're on your fucking lair and your goblins. Christ, I'm the worst DM. <laughs> I like Aram's momentary panic of like, whoa, the goblins have a lair action in my town. Completely bought it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, here comes the giant goblin cannon. I'm so dumb. All right, hang on. I'm, I'm writing down giant goblin cannon. Shut up. From the roof of the church behind you, Aram, you, you hear uh, something call out, I'd look up. Turning and looking, you can see uh, a goblin who is like holding by the collar of their dress a what appears to be dwarven woman. She has sort of long, flowing, like curly blonde hair and what? what? Which hangs over her face. Make a perception check for me. That's going to be a five plus four is nine. Near as you can tell, this is an actual dwarven woman, not, in fact, a goblin in a dress. That he would immediately turn and go sprinting towards there to catch this dwarven woman. Like, whoa, no, what are you doing? Uh, when you do this, Bullrush, Bumble, and Grumble are going to make attacks of opportunity against you for leaving their threatened area. Right, right. <laughs> That's an 11 and a five and a 10. All miss. Every Jesus single one. Jesus Christ. Bumble doesn't attack, but Dogbait does, because Dogbait actually has a melee weapon. And he has plus four, because he's using a weapon that he's actually good with, unlike the other ones, which gives him a 15 total, which I think actually hits you. That's going to hit. So you take, you finally take 1d6 plus two of damage. Hey, it's a six. So you take eight and half it. So you take four. I take four. Yeah. All right. <laughs> She just nickbait. Dogbait manages to deal twice his hit points in damage with his scimitar. <laughs> As you go running off, the goblin on the roof lets go of the woman and she drops. Oh, I've got you. Athletics, I'm assuming? Sure, why not? Natural 20, natural. This guy comes in like a wide receiver. <laughs> catches them and then rolls, but perfectly protects her. He's on one knee as her hair's in front of her face. It's all right, ma'am. I've got you. 
She she flicks her head to flick her hair back, and you can see it's a goblin in a wig. <laughs> My hero. And she grabs you and kisses you on the mouth. <laughs> We're now in Bugs Buddy territory, and I 100% approve. There's going to be two things that happen here. The first thing is a sleight of hand check. <laughs> I rolled two. So the goblin, the goblin attempts to steal your decanter of endless water that's hanging at your side, fails, and then uses its nimble escape ability to disengage and run after kissing you on the mouth and failing to steal your magic item. Oh, he's heated. The other goblin, the one that was on the roof, disappears from the roof and takes off as well. Bumble is going to take the dodge action. Bullrush is going to ready an attack to attack you if you get within range. And Dogbait is going to move to the other side of the barrels. Uh, Grumble, who you just shoulder rammed, is going to ready an attack to hit you as well. So, Rob, after your grand heroics, it is now your turn. Who is the nearest goblin? Whom is the nearest unfortunate soul? So the thing is, you have two options right now. There's the goblin that kissed you. They've run off in one direction. And then there's the goblins back where you left them, the ones that just did the opportunity attack, who are all, like, assuming full-blown Power Ranger battle stances around these kegs. Mortesh! He roars in rage, turns back around, sees them on his barrels of ale, and charges right back at them and swings. You're going to have disadvantage on this because the lead goblin for that took the dodge action. First roll is six plus nine, so 15. And my second roll is six plus 17. So does a 15 hit this goblin? 15 does not hit Bumble. Bumble's the one in the wood stove. 15 doesn't hit, okay, which is good because I rolled a 12. So that would have been 18 points of damage, but it glances off this stupid stove and yeah. just drives into the dirt. It's probably really loud though. He might take like one point of thunder damage or something. It's like ringing a bell. <laughs> just have him roll a constitution save to see if he stunned this round or not. It's gonna be a DC 10. All right, he rolled a 12. It rings, it's thunderous. And this draws your attention away from the fact that you've just run into range of one of the goblins that just prepared an attack. I think Bullrush and Grumble both actually. So Bullrush gets a 13, uh, Grumble rolls a seven. So once again, two misses with their reactions. That makes it Grumble's turn after Aram's turn. Warhammer coming at you. It's a six on the die. Man, man. <laughs> this is unbelievable. They are particularly bad goblins. Yeah, they are. That's because they're also trying to hide behind barrels and each other while they're swinging at you. And a wood stove. At the end of this round, one goblin, fucking placid expression on his face, manages to drive a donkey-drawn cart into the center of town. <laughs> Snail and Panic have entered the fray. At the top of the round, Bumble is going to pick up one of the kegs and hop it into the back of the wagon. That'll be his action. He will bonus action disengage and then jump in the wagon. I need to, I need to make a like a wagon row here. So Snails and Panic are in the wagon. Bumble just jumped into the wagon. Snails just arrived. So I'm gonna say that Snails is action. Bullrush, without having the Battlemaster class, can you attempt to trip somebody? Basically, if you can sell me that it will be cool or funny enough, I will, I'll let that slide. Aram will be on board for it. Snails comes, Snails comes rolling up real slow, you know, kind of casually. And as the, as these goblins are getting ready, you know, Panic is flitting around in the back, you know, obviously panicked. And another goblin hops out looking like they're probably going to help load barrels into the wagon. And then on Bullrush's turn, I'm going to tap another of my expendable goblins. He's going to get down on his hands and knees right behind Aram, like behind Aram's knees, and then Bullrush is just going to shove Aram and make him trip over the <laughs> goblin behind him. And probably get crushed by your spiked armor in the process. Wow, I'm so sold on that. It's going to have to be unopposed athletics but i'm going to give i'm going to give the goblins advantage cuz they were they were prepared for this maneuver 
Come on, Bull Rush. Why? Why with the single digits? Okay, you only have to be 10. 5 plus 5 is 10. <laughs> Bull Rush got a 7 plus 4 for 11. <laughs> it's not pretty. No. But it worked. It's not pretty at all. It's really not pretty because you're also wearing an entirely spiked wardrobe and you fall over backwards onto a goblin. Right. The thing is, this also makes it much harder to stand up. There's now a goblin, in, a dead goblin impaled on your armor. Okay, so you are on your back. Son of a bitch. All right. You're also on this other goblin's back. Oh, okay. I, I just, oh, I'm so mad. I'm so mad. I am going to get up. So I guess you. Know, I will expend half my movement to untangle myself and stand up. Is there a goblin I can reach? On their turn, uh, Dogbait and Panic hupped one more of the three barrels into the back of the wagon. I think Bull Rush is still right there. He just knocked you over. But I'm not worried about killing more goblins. That's not what I want. What I want is to stop them from taking my ale. So I am going to take a brisk and lift my huge giant ax above my head. And I want to throw this ax with all my strength so that it buries itself in the wheel of that wagon. I thought you were gonna kill the donkey. <laughs> I also fully expected that, but I'm glad we didn't go animal cruelty on right? this one. <laughs> you both are sick. No. no, no, we weren't fucking happy Look, about it. <laughs> I play assholes, but I don't play animal killers. Come on. Fucking attack the wheel of the wagon then. All right, what the hell am I rolling for this bullshit? I mean, an attack, I guess. I All right. Guess. It's a ranged attack, though, so you have to use your dexterity. This is true. All right, fair. Three plus 19 is 22. Three plus 19. Was 19 the die roll? Yes, 19 was the die okay. roll. So three <laughs> plus 19 is 22. The damage would the damage would be eight plus four is 12. Okay, yeah, that's, that's going to be enough to just... Plus two, because I'm raging, so 14. It's going to be enough to break through the rim of the wheel, so it's actually... Right. It's not even necessarily that you've broken the wheel to the point where it can't drive. It's that your axe is driven into the ground in the rim of the wheel. So it cannot possibly turn anymore because your axe is actually stuck in as part of it. And then I will move the my half movement like a whole 10 feet, 10 feet, just just, just stomping forward. The, yeah. Fair enough. I believe it is Grumble's turn now. It is Grumble's turn. There's one keg left to throw in the cart, but the cart, cart has just kind of been immobilized. Grumble's just gonna shoot Fivig's back as Fivig walks away from him <laughs> to retrieve his ax. 15. Hey, Grum that's a Grumble second hits. hit. <laughs> yeah, it's the second oh. hit. I hate this goblet in particular. It swings in roundabouts. Uh, that's a one on the D6 this time for a total of three, which you have to one for your rage. <laughs> <laughs> One more point of damage. You know, this is going right after we talk about how lethal a mob of goblins can be. <laughs> Maybe I should start playing them a little bit more intelligently. It's the top of the initiative. So you just basically like wing me with this arrow and he doesn't even look back. He just takes it and just keeps stomping forward. It's just one more spike on your armor. That's right. Top of the initiative, goblins. At count 20, there's a thundering sound. <laughs> Legendary action as a entire herd of swine, three goblins mounted atop three of the pigs, comes charging into the town square. The goblins are whooping, hollering, keeping the pigs on the move, and this like swarm of pigs comes crashing through the middle of this combat. I want everyone involved in this combat who isn't on the cart to make a strength save. It's gonna be a DC 13. Strength save. Strength okay. save? Okay, bull rush. Bull Rush is good. Dog bait. A natural 20. Grumble. I'm sad about it. I really, I wanted, I imagine I can't make any progress. Like I might not get, like, like I didn't get stampeded, but. Oh no, this is an instantaneous event. <laughs> okay, gotcha, yeah, fair. Uh, Bull Rush gets rolled a 19. So Bull Rush got a 21. Uh, Dog bait rolled a 15, minus one for 14. And Grumble rolled a two plus zero for two. <laughs> Grumble fires this arrow. The swine come running through this fight. The goblins on the cart like just kind of get up like on the walls of it to make sure they're out of the range. Rom, you tank a pig. Just it hits you and you just shift it off to the side. Grumble just 
a pig hits his entire body, and there is nowhere he can go but where the pig goes now. <laughs> and then running along. This is just geometrically, it, there is no possibility for motion aside from where pig brings me. The very first thing that happened is that he did that kind of dodge move as he got tackled by one of the goblins. Now that he's like fully awake and fully aware, he's just one after the next. Just just as each pig charges, he just spins off them one after the next. As he gets closer and closer, he keeps rolling off pigs, but his eyes never leave the riders, and he's still enraged. All right. So All right. Loudmouth and Boils are now in the fight, too, on the pigs. Grumble has just been taken out of the okay. fight, <laughs> swept off by a pig. We're going to say that Grumble survives this fight because he's earned a retirement. Grumble may appear again later, potentially. <laughs> in future episodes of Kill Every Monster. So the pigs are, are kind of here in the town square. So what we're going to have happen is from the roof of the windmill in the center of town, two goblins who have been waiting to provide covering fire for the cart are now going to realize that stopping you from getting the axe is probably their best bet. So they're both going to attack, and since you didn't know that they were there, they're attacking with advantage this round. All right. First one is a 15. Hit. Just. <laughs> Second one, ah, is a 18 plus four for 22. Both hit. Ooh. Yeah. Starting You're to get dangerous. Take. You might have hit like 10% damage. Well, he's a barbarian, so he's probably got quite a bit of health. I need another D8. There we go. Two crossbow bolts come flying into you. First one does three points of damage, halved to one. Second one also does three points of damage, halved to one. Son of a bitch. Wow. Wow. These dice are fired. All my dice are fired. Uh, as a bonus action, each of them will attempt to hide back on their roof. Uh, that is a natural one for Cracktooth. Doesn't matter. Don't care about them. He's been shot three times. He hasn't even looked up from his axe. So Cracktooth got a natural one. Cracktooth basically tries to, like, get up to the top and hide behind the little fucking standard issue rooster on the uh, compass thing. Tries to hide behind the wind vane. That's the word for it. There you go. And it just snaps and he just rolls off the side. <laughs> <laughs> he lands in a direction that we cannot see, so it's there is plausible deniability that he's okay. He he may or may not be fine. He may have successfully hidden because you don't have line of sight to him anymore. Yeah. Uh, Lurker rolled a three plus six for a total of nine. So Lurker tries to hide behind the spinning, uh, you know, blades of the windmill, but then they keep moving and he's not hidden anymore. <laughs> Bumble in his wood stove spends his entire turn clambering into the back of the cart. Panic and Bull Rush are going to hop the third keg into the back of the wagon. Snails is going to shoot Fivig with a hand crossbow. At 21 to hit. Definitely hits. Uh, hand crossbow is D6. Yeah, D6. For another one plus two halved to one damage. This is amazing. I talked I talked so much shit about how lethal goblins can be, and then I'm rolling single digits for everything. On Dogbait's turn, which is right before yours, Dogbait is going to, for the first time, actually do something. Scramble up into the wagon next to Bumble, who just managed to climb in, and Dogbait's going to go, Hey, Bumble, why don't you put some of that weight to use? And he pushes him. <laughs> back out of the wagon onto the haft of the axe. And so the full weight of this fat goblin and wood stove just chunks onto the lever of the axe, which I think should free it. Rom, do you have any objection to that just working or? Absolutely not. That is fantastic. It should definitely work. Pops it out like a lever. It goes into the air, spins a couple of times and lands like standard deal. We get the camera shot of Bumble's face and then the axe just lands in front of it but he's not dead. And then the furnace door flips up and covers Bumble's face up. All right, uh, Boils and Loudmouth both ride around on their pigs, and that's a Rom's turn. I pick up my ax. Yes. And, I, and I'm still enraged, so there's no slowing him down. Can he reach a goblin? I mean, your ax landed in front of Bumble. I was gonna say, Bumble is prone on the ground. He's marching towards the wagon, 
he doesn't even look down at his axe as he swipes it up in one movement, lifts it above his head, and brings it straight back down. All right, you have advantage because Bumble's prone. I'm terribly sorry, Bumble. Well, he's got he's got plate armor, so you might miss. I have advantage. My first roll is 12. My second roll oh, is 9. I rolled a 6 plus 6 is 12. Then I rolled a 3 plus 6 is 9. Bumble lives. You crack the wood stove open like an egg, basically, and then Bumble will just scramble out of it and run away. <laughs> <laughs> Fivik brings his axe down on this poor, battered wood stove, which has been hit by an axe once or twice already, knocked over twice, fallen on top of the axe haft from the height of the back of the cart. This this rusty cast iron stove can take no more abuse, and your fine adventuring equipment just cleaves through it, cracking it open like an Easter egg, revealing a, a fat and naked goblin <laughs> who's been tucked away inside this thing the entire time. Like a hermit crab. Who, like like a hermit crab. Like a little pig hermit crab. Takes his action to disengage and scramble away on all fours up into the cart. I think at this point the cart starts moving. Yeah, I think Panic is actually going to seize the reins. There's no way. From snails and... If that takes off at full speed, I can't keep up with that. Rom, I'm going to give you a, a final round to try to, like stop this or make your final stand but I think the goblins might have this one. Then the okay, then the only thing he could possibly do is try to sprint and leap and either grab onto or land in the wagon. More likely grab onto. He doesn't have a very good vertical leap as a dwarf. So I imagine he's going to like try and run up and leap and just try and grab onto the back of the wagon. This is going to be your athletics. All right. 19 plus 5 is going to be 24. This thing just starts to move. Like it's getting up to pace. It's got like a weird kind of disjointed roll because one of the wheels is broken and it starts rolling towards the road out of town. Unacceptable. You give it everything you have. You run as fast as your stubby little legs can take you and you leap. You have to make it into a full swing with the axe where you just lunge forward and bury it into the back and just start climbing up the haft of the axe. Enraged, bleeding, heaving dwarf just climbing up the back of your wagon. As the cart pulls out of town and Panic is screaming in the, the front of the cart as the dwarf is pulling his way up and the rest of the goblins are sort of you know, getting ready to fight. It, it moves past the windmill, which is, you know, turning in the breeze and flings Lurker, who attempts to land in the back of the wagon. Lurker only gets a 10. So Lurker sails through the air with just tremendous grace. And quite frankly, the thing you're trying to do is use the momentum of a windmill to launch yourself onto a donkey cart, which I think is higher than a DC 10. Aram, there is a split second of concern for Fizzik when there's a goblin hurtling towards him from the air. What the hell? And the cart just keeps going forward, and then a goblin just rolls through the road. In the back of the wagon, the, the goblins are, you know, they watch as Lurker just goes sailing over the top of the wagon, crashes into the side of a building or onto the cobblestones or something. Loudmouth and Boils are currently riding pigs in formation alongside this donkey cart. Dogbait is running around. Panic is driving. Snails walks up, kicks Dogbait into you, and the full weight of Dogbait just goes tumbling out the back of the wagon and slams into you. Okay, I need you to make a strength saver. Um... The way that Snails does it is so disconcertingly calm and calculated that it's just like, hmm, guess dog bait's gotta go. Boop. <laughs> All right, so I'm making a strength save against DC, let's say 15. Five plus nine is 14. Dog bait makes his grand and noble sacrifice. Right. As he tumbles head over heels, lands, I'm going to say ass first on the dwarf. 
there is a moment where you reach up and try to like shove the goblin off but that like throws you completely off balance because now you're hanging by one arm and now you've like finally managed to get the goblin off and you go to reach back up and you look over and you see the goblins all just like four of them on the back of the thing just pry the axe loose eye contact and release tumbling out just fast enough that like if you got up and started running you wouldn't catch it yeah they're gone. just slow enough to be insulting right the donkey drags the cart trundling along unevenly with three barrels of garlic beer off to the single most disappointing celebration in goblinoid history the camera pans down watching Fivig chase the cart and you see the water wheel from the mill which has been severed from its connection just now floating like a raft with uh, Grumble just sitting in the middle of it just kind of tootling down the stream and watching as, as Fivig chases the cart pointlessly Thank you for joining Kill Every Monster and our guests, Michael Loving, as we talked a little bit about the Goblin. Want to see our Lorekeeper notes for the Goblin encounters? Check out all of our subscriber rewards at patreon.com slash killeverymonster. If you want to suggest creatures for future episodes or talk about the monsters we've discussed on the show, head over to our Discord. You can find the links at killeverymonster.com. And we'll see you next time for Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. Monster. This show was produced and edited by Dead Ghost Productions. Find out more about us and all the shows we make at deadghostpro.com. <laughs>